to our Bible study together with me, uh, Father Valentinus by Yohadi Ruseno OP, uh, a Dominican priest assigned currently in Indonesia, Surabaya, Indonesia. And I would like to welcome you. I have come and joined for our Bible study tonight. Those who are coming from different parts of Indonesia and different parts of the Philippines and uh, Malaysia, Singapore, and other parts of the world. And I would like to apologize first before I before we start the Bible study that uh, currently we have a little problem with our OBS, uh, our system in the in Zoom. So uh, if you are if you are participating through Zoom, you might uh, you may see that uh, our screen is not properly adjusted. So if you are distracted by the the current setting in Zoom meeting, you might you might go and check in YouTube uh, via YouTube because I think uh, if you try to participate through YouTube, uh, YouTube my channel YouTube, it is much better. Yeah, the screen is much better. Okay, without further ado, I would like to apologize and let's go to our prayer, asking for the guidance of the Holy Spirit. I am the Father, the Son of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit and they shall be created and you shall renew the face of the earth. O God, who by the light of the Spirit did instruct the hearts of the faithful, Grant that by the same Holy Spirit we may be truly wise and ever enjoy his consolations. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Lady of the Holy Rosary, pray for us. Saint Joseph, patron of the Universal Church, pray for us. Saint Dominic de Guzman, pray for us. Saint Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and the snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And you do, o Prince of Heavenly Hosts, by the power of God, cross into hell, Satan, and all evil spirits who will wander through the world for the reign of our souls. Amen. In him, the Father, the Son of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Once again, welcome everyone. And uh, tonight we're going to have a special edition of our Bible study because we are about to enter the Holy Week. And this coming Sunday, uh, we're going to celebrate the Palm Sunday. It's uh, the beginning of the Holy Week, Palm Sunday of the Lord's Passion. And because of that, I decided to have a special uh, edition that we are going to focus on the Passion Narrative that we're going to listen this coming Sunday. And it's the Passion Narrative according to St. Luke because we are now in liturgical year C that we're going to... We're going to listen from the Passion Narrative according to St. Luke. Uh, just to, to remind you that um, we are not going to be able to discuss everything because Passion Narrative according to Luke is the longest among the four Gospels. So, and because we have limited time, so we're going to discuss not everything, but uh, some salient points in our reading. Okay, so we move immediately, and I try to highlight also some of the uh, unique and distinction, yeah, the things that are unique to the Gospel of Luke compared to other Gospel, and what will be the dominant theological view of Saint Luke in his Passion narrative. Yeah, we start from the agony in the garden. Then going out, he went. That was his custom to the Mount of Olives, and the disciples followed him. When he arrived at the place, he said to them, "Pray that you may uh, you may not undergo the test." After withdrawing about a stone's throw from the and kneeling, he prayed, saying, "Father, if you are willing, take this cup away from me. Still, not my will, but yours be done." And to and him, an angel from heaven appeared to him. He was such agony, and he prayed so fervently that he, his sweat became like drops of blood falling on the ground. When he rose 
from prayer returned to his disciple, he found them sleeping from grief. He said to them, why are you sleeping? Get up and pray that you may not undergo the test. Okay, so this is in the garden, Jesus. So where was Jesus during the agony? Uh, by the way, the term of uh, agony in the garden was coming from Saint Luke, yeah, because the word agony, agony, yeah, uh, Jesus agana, it was in agony is coming from the Gospel of Luke. It's explicitly mentioned, <laughs> yeah. So we owe to Saint Luke for this particular term, yeah. Jesus was in the garden, yeah. So Jesus was in the garden of Gethsemane, and it was mentioned the garden was. Uh, on the Mount of Olive, yeah. The Mount of Olive was located at the east of Jerusalem. You see, if you see the the map provided on your screen, so this is Jerusalem and city of Jerusalem, and this is the Temple Mount, the Temple of Jerusalem, uh, and then going to the east side of the temple, you're going to pass the Valley Kidron, Kidron Valley, and then you're going to climb another hill which is the Mount of Olives, where, uh, as the name suggested, it is where many olives, olive trees grew during those times. Okay. Let's see what we can get from this episode, from this segment. The garden's name, Gethsemane, yeah, the place. So the, the meaning of Gethsemane is the place for making olive oil or olive press. That's the way how we're going to make uh, an olive oil to pressing, yeah, to crushing and pressing the fruits of the olive, olive fruits. Now, uh, a bit different from the other synoptic gospel from Matthew and Mark, the word Gethsemane was not mentioned, yeah, was not mentioned explicitly by Luke. And Jesus also withdrew himself. And the names of the three disciples who were with him were not also mentioned explicitly. If you try to compare it in the other gospel, the three uh, close disciples of Jesus, yeah, the inner circle of Jesus, Peter, John, and James were mentioned explicitly, but in the case of Luke, their names were not mentioned. Uh, however, Luke also mentioned this uh, little information, little detail, interesting detail that according to his custom, Jesus used to pray in the Mount of Olives. It said uh, from this information that we know that it is the habit of Jesus to pray. And he always pray when he go to Jerusalem. He always spend time in the Mount of Olives for praying whole night long. Yeah, And if you try to go deeper into the to the gospel of Luke the Luke presented Jesus as someone who is very very prayerful in many moments important moments of Jesus uh, Jesus always praying from the moment of baptism it is a prayerful moment the moment of uh, transfiguration it is a prayerful moment for Jesus is a praying moment for Jesus. Even now, when Jesus entering his agony, it is also a praying and a prayerful moment for Jesus. Jesus is depicted as someone who is very, very prayerful in the Gospel of Luke, including when he is facing his passion and death. So a little detail, but very interesting, yeah? Now, the word cup is also mentioned. It's uh, cup is mentioned in... Uh, in other gospel, yeah, and cup, yeah, as usually a symbol of divine judgment and suffering. You can compare this to Isaiah 51 and yes, yes, Kiel, yeah, yes, Kiel 30, 23. I'm sorry. If you're going back to the Old Testament, the cup usually referred to the divine judgment or suffering. So Jesus was. In his, humanity, in his humanity, Jesus was, of course, trembling at the prospect of his suffering and death uh, that, he, that he will endure, that is symbolized by the symbol of the cup. Now, what is in, 
what another thing another interesting thing is that the presence of the angel as the father's answer to Jesus prayer this is also unique to the gospel of Luke uh, the presence of the angel and the presence of the angel appeared in several important episodes of Jesus in the gospel of Luke also yeah, like in this like for example in the 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 temptation in the desert 40 days in the desert uh, angel appeared also to minister to Jesus yeah and in the acts chapter 1 uh, sorry in Luke 24 during the resurrection of Jesus yeah the empty tomb another angel appeared there and now angel was ministering also to Jesus during his agony in the in the garden so this is also unique to the unique to the gospel of Luke that God, well, the cup of suffering was not taken from Jesus. However, God the Father is comforting Jesus through his angel. So we can see that Jesus also experiencing terrible things, yeah, because he's going to uh, having this emotional difficulty, yeah, stressful moment because he's going to face this passion yeah this passion and death and another interesting thing that this saint luke mentioned in his gospel is that jesus sweat became like drops of blood now according to some of my according to my doctor friend yeah physician friend uh, we have a medical term for this condition yeah this is what we call the hematohydrosis yeah Hemato is blood, yeah, and hydro, hydro, yeah, it's water or sweat. So blood and sweat, yeah. Uh, it's, the stress was so extreme to the point that some of the blood vessel uh, kind exploded or burst and sweat and blood came out from the body of Jesus. You can imagine how powerful the the stress and the emotions that Jesus has to experience during this moment. That's why God the Father was sending one of his angels to comfort Jesus in this moment of difficult time. Yeah. So this is interesting. Yeah. You can see the the moment the agony of the garden is a uh, moment you one of moment of that Jesus show his humanity to the fullest. Yeah, humanity to the fullest. He experienced what many of us experience in the same condition. However, uh, if you try to look deeper, yeah, if you try to look deeper into the meaning of the text, you're going to see also that there's important symbolism, yeah, important, important relation, important connection with the Old Testament. Especially when Jesus was connected to the to the to the old Adam, because here uh, Jesus was also presented by Luke as the new Adam. Uh, if you try to compare, you're going to find something interesting. Like for example, old Adam was at the Garden of Eden, Jesus at the Garden of Gethsemane. Old Adam disobedience to God's will. Yeah. While Jesus, the new Adam, obedience to God's will. Despite of his suffering and death, he was obedient. And because of this obedience of Adam, the first Adam, curse is the ground because of you. Yeah, And by the sweat of your face, you shall eat the bread. Uh, Jesus was sweating. Remember, Jesus was sweating, sweating blood. And this blood is... Uh, falling into the ground and this is the same yeah the same expression what happened when adam was was sinning against the will of god yeah by the sweat of your face you shall eat the bread and because of that the ground was cursed the earth was cursed yeah his sweat became like drops of blood falling on the ground and look is particularly pointing out to these details that make us realize the connection with the first Adam. The creation was cursed because the sin of Adam. 
And through Jesus' blood and his obedience, Adam's curses are undone. You can see that this kind of um, what we call as the pattern of relation, yeah, typology is being is very prominent in the Gospel of Luke. Jesus was presented as the new Adam, as the old the first Adam failed, the new Adam will give and reverse the curses. Okay, we continue. There is there are there are interesting things that we're going to discuss along the way. Yeah, Jesus at the Garden of Gethsemane. Yeah, olives, the uh, precious fruits for the Israelites. So one of the one of the most precious fruits and trees for the Jewish people is the uh, olives, yeah. It's common fruits and trees in Palestine. And it has so many functions and so many utilities from the daily and secular use, mundane use, to sacred, yeah, sacred functions. Like, for example, it's, it's for daily household needs. Yeah? You can use that for seasoning. You can use that for cooking and, and also medicines. And however, it can be used also for spiritual and sacred needs. Like for example, for anointing of the kings, priests, and prophets, the oil being used is the olive oil. Yeah. So the word uh, chrism, the word um, Messiah being anointed, it's related with the uh, olive oil. And also what is interesting, olive oil is also part of sacrificial offerings in the temple. You can check that in the book of Numbers, uh, chapter 20, verse 5, that one of the offerings for God is also the olive oil. Or, uh, okay. Now, what is interesting is, according to some Jewish traditions, uh, states that olive tree is actually the tree of life in the middle of the Garden of Eden. Yeah, the, so this is coming from the life of Adam and Eve. This is an apocryphal Jewish book. And though it is interesting to see that how uh, this literature pointed out to the fact that the, the, the fruits, the middle of the, of the garden was not apple. <laughs> it's not apple, yeah, but of uh, olive oil. Yeah, sorry, <laughs> olive. It's an olive tree, yeah? And of course, the olive fruits. But I just need, I just need to remind you that uh, if you're going back to the story of Adam and Eve, you're going to see that in the middle of the garden, there are two trees, yeah? There are two different trees. One is the tree of life that will, they, one is the tree of life and the other one is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. What is forbidden to be eaten is this one, yeah, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But they're supposed to eat. They're supposed to eat the tree of life. Yeah, they're supposed to eat the fruits coming from the tree of life. And this is the real tree that sustains their life. Again, this is uh, the, the beautiful depiction what happened in the beginning of our uh, humanity, yeah, the beginning of humanity. Jesus' choice of Garden of Gethsemane and Mount of Olive was not a coincidence because Jesus presented himself as the new tree of life. Yeah, yeah. why, why this is interesting, yeah, because in order that olive tree has to produce and being used properly to become an oil, it has to be crushed. And Jesus was being crushed, being crushed, being destroyed. And because of his blood coming out from his body, uh, this we are safe. Yeah, we are safe. So the process of making olive oil, and it is interesting. Uh, first, you need to, of course, you get the fruits first, and then you're going to crush the, with the meal, yeah. Uh, crush the, you're going to grind the fruits 
using the grind mill. And then after that, you're going to press the palm, yeah? You're going to press the crushed fruits. And during that, and only then the oil comes out from the fruits, yeah? Comes out from the fruits. And only that time, the oil can be used for, the, for different purposes. The same, yeah? Jesus has to be crushed first. Jesus has to be, uh, has to endure suffering and death in order that he may produce he may produce salvation and grace for us yeah because he is the nutrient of life yeah that will give life to those who uh, to those who eat the fruits and use the fruits yeah so this is a little interesting detail uh, but if you try to have the typological connection between Jesus and Adam between Jesus and the garden, even Jesus and the tree of life, yeah. Okay, we continue. Well, he was still speaking. A crowd approached and in front of, and in front was one of the 12, a man named Judas, who went up to Judas to kiss him. Jesus said to him, Judas, are you betraying the son of man with a kiss? His disciple realized what was about to happen, and they asked, Lord, shall we strike with a sword? When one of them struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. But Jesus said in reply, stop, no more of this. Then he touched the servant's ear and healed him. And Jesus said to the chief priests and temple guards and elders who had come for him, have he come out against a robber with swords and clubs? Day after day, I was with you in the temple area, and you did not seize me. But this is your hour. But this is your hour, the time for the power of darkness. Yeah, Jesus was arrested yeah, after spending time in prayer. Uh, Jude, Judas, yeah, Judas Iscariot came and betrayed Jesus with a kiss. Yeah. So why with the kiss? Because this is a common way of uh, greeting people during those times. And of course, uh, it was dark that is, <laughs> and there was no social media during those times. So some people are, who are not yet familiar with the face of Jesus. <laughs> so they need somebody really, really familiar with Jesus to avoid the mistaken identity. Yeah? And of course, uh, Judah kiss as a sign, and as a sign that this is truly Jesus. Disciple of Jesus, Peter, of course, uh, it was not named here, but it was later on named, the Gospel of John, drew a sword and cut off ear of the high priest's servant. Jesus later healed him. This is interesting because they were fishermen. <laughs> uh, this guy are fishermen, or yeah, and they are not soldiers. And when fishermen carrying in, carrying in with them sword and other weapons, uh, you know that things are getting dangerous. Yeah, things are getting dangerous, and they are ready for war. But again, Jesus has to remind them, this is not the way of Jesus. Yeah, this is not the way of Jesus. This is the hour of the time for the power of darkness. Another unique from the Gospel of Luke. Uh, meaning the conflict between Jesus and the power of darkness has reached its climax. So Jesus recognized that his passion, death, and resurrection is part of the struggle with the power of darkness, with the kingdom of Satan. So the final battle. Jesus was betrayed. Yeah. Judas Iscariot and Jesus. Uh, Jesus was sold for 30 pieces of silver. Yeah, it, this is according to Matthew 26 and by his own brother, yeah, quote in quote, because Jesus are uh, called, Jesus was calling his disciples also as his brothers. Yeah. And this is interesting 30 pieces is uh, the price of a slave. Yeah. And this kind of situation will remind us that in the Old Testament, someone was also who was also sold as a slave by his brothers also his name is joseph from this we are starting to recognize that there is 
another typological connection between Jesus and Joseph of the Old Testament. Iya, Peter. And for your information also, it is interesting that Judas, yeah, Judas is actually a variant. Yeah, it's a variant name from Judah. Yeah, Judah or Judahite. And Judah is one is one who is responsible for the selling of Joseph. Yeah, one of the one of the prominent uh, one of the major character that responsible in the selling and selling of Joseph as a slave. The, the, from here we can see Jesus as the new Joseph. We try to compare the two. Yeah, Joseph sold as slave by Judah. And his brothers sold as a slave by Judas. Yeah, <laughs> accused falsely and imprisoned by foreign nation Egyptians. Accused falsely and imprisoned by foreign nation the Romans. Entered the dungeon. Jesus entered the earth during the burial. Yeah, raised to the important position. Jesus raised from the dead. Joseph saved his family and his people. And through his death and resurrection, Jesus saved his family and his people. Yeah. So we can see the connection, the typological connection. It's not only Adam, but also Joseph. Okay. Yeah, let's see the Peter's denial of Jesus. After arresting him, they let him away, took him into the house of high priests, Peter was following at a distance. They lit a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat around it, and Peter sat down with them. When a maid saw him seated in the light, she looked intently at him and said, This man too was with him. But he denied it, saying, Woman, I do not know him. Short while later, someone else saw him and said, You two are one of them. But Peter answered, my friend, I am not. About an hour later, still another insisted, assuredly this man too was with him, for he also is a Galilean. But Peter said, my friend, I do not know what you are talking about. Just as he was saying this, the cock crowed. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered the word of the Lord. How he had said to him, before the cock crows today, you will deny me three times. He went out and began to be bitterly. Okay, just to give you a little geographical context again. Uh, Jesus was arrested. So this is uh, Jerusalem, yeah? This is Jerusalem Temple. Jerusalem, uh, sorry, Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem, Temple of Jesus. Yeah, this is the Temple of Jerusalem. And this is uh, where? This is Gethsemane. So Jesus was arrested here. And then he was brought into the city of Jerusalem. And then he was brought to the to the place of the high priest. Yeah, house of Kayafa. Somewhere here. Yeah, somewhere here. Okay. We focus on Peter's denial. But we try to compare Peter's denial story, uh, yeah, episode, in Luke. With the other gospel, uh, it was softer, quote unquote, compared to the ones in Mark and Matthew. Because if you try to read uh, the version of Mark and Matthew, uh, Peter was even cursing, yeah, was cursing. Now, it is not clear uh, Peter was cursing himself or cursing the Lord. It's not clear in the text. But compare, but in the Gospel of Luke, we don't find that kind of uh, actions and reactions coming from Peter. So in a sense, we can see that uh, Peter's denial is much uh, softer compared, milder compared to the Mark and Matthew. Now, what is interesting, the more Peter denied, the more Peter was recognized as Jesus' disciples. Why? Because of the Galilean accent. It seems that, of course, I don't know how to, I don't know how Galilean and the Judean 
speak differently. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know the Galilean accents or the Judean accent during Jesus' time, but it seems that they have a different accent though, despite they are speaking the same language of uh, Hebrew or, or Aramaic. Yeah? And the more Peter speaks, yeah, the more he is being recognized as Galileans. And people knew. Yeah, people knew that Jesus was Galilean and many of his disciples are Galileans. Yeah, So Jesus, the more he speaks, the more he re- reveal himself. <laughs> the more he speaks denying Jesus, the more he reveal himself as the disciple of Jesus because of his accent. Yeah, yeah. be careful when we speak. <laughs> and the drama of denial was concluded with Jesus looking at Peter. So this is something unique also in the Gospel of Luke. Yeah, Peter was able, or Jesus was able to you know, to gaze to stare at Peter and Peter realize you know, what Jesus said during the last supper yeah okay that's a little drama with Peter's denial trial of Jesus before Sanhedrin yeah the men who held Jesus in custody were ridiculing and beating him they blindfolded him and questioned him saying prophesy who is it that struck you And they reviled him and saying many other things against him. When they came, the council of elders of the people met both priests, both chief priests and the scribes. And they brought him before their Sanhedrin. They said, if you are Messiah, tell us. But he replied to them, if I tell you, you will not believe. If I question, you will not respond. But from this time, from this time on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the power of God. They all asked, Are you then the Son of God? He replied to them, You say that I am. Then they said, What further need we have before testimony? We have heard it from his own mouth. Okay, so this this short trial before the Sanhedrin. So the first trial, because Jesus have two trials. Uh, in fact, Jesus have three trials in the Gospel of Luke. We will see later. The first trial is before the high tribunal of the Jewish uh, religious leaders. This is what we call Sanhedrin. Yeah. So Sanhedrin consisted of 70 council members. Mostly are the Sadducees, uh, but also they have some Pharisees with them. And the high priest, as The high priest during those time as the serving as the ex officio uh, chair, some yeah, ex officio chair of the Sanhedrin. Yeah, during those time the chair was Caiaphas, but uh, Anas, the previous high priest, he also still exerted some important influence. Also, so Anas and Caiaphas are the minds behind the crucifixion of Jesus. It had significant influence in the religious affairs, both in the temple and in all practically Judea. In fact, they have a kind of police power. If you read a while ago, there are uh, when Jesus was arrested. Uh, Jesus was arrested by the temple guards. <laughs> in a sense, uh, this Sanhedrin has have a police power. They can arrest people also if they. Recognize that some Jewish people are not faithful to the to the Jewish law or to the regulation and laws enacted by the Sanhedrin. However, they cannot impose. Yeah, they cannot impose uh, death penalty because this is pro- this is prohibited by the Roman laws. During those time, uh, Israelites were. Under the occupation of the Roman Empire, so and one of the regulation is they are not allowed to pass the the death penalty to their fellow Jewish people. Jesus was brought to the house of the high priest, and this is unusual. Yeah, uh, this is unusual place to settle or resolve an issue. Why? Because the usual place to have things resolve uh, for the judgment or for the hearing for the trial supposed to be around the temple, not in the private house of a high priest. So we can see that there is a need for speedy trial. And when there is a too speed, yeah, there is so much speech and uh, rush, uh, you know that this is 
injustice. Yeah. Injustice is happening because of there is no fail, there is no uh, fair trial happening here. And of course, before the trial, Jesus was ridiculed and even beaten. Yeah. Uh, now, unlike the other gospel, there is the false witnesses did not appear in Luke. And Jesus immediately answered the questions of the high priest. Uh, yeah, compared to the the other gospel accounts, uh, Jesus' trial before Sanhedrin was pretty fast, <laughs> pretty fast, because Jesus immediately yeah uh, answered the questions and revealed his identity. Uh, first, when it comes to Messiah, Jesus immediately say that it is useless that I claim that I am Messiah because you will not believe you will not believe that yeah. And and if he if Jesus was asking them about something, Jesus knew also that they will not answer Jesus. And eventually, Jesus revealed Himself as the Son of Man. So this is important because the word the term of Son of Man can uh, has important and significant meaning. Because if you're going back to the Daniel chapter seven verse thirteen. There is an appearance of the Son of Man, and we, as Son of Man, that is extraordinary. Yeah, we try to read the verse as the visions during the night continued. So this is Daniel uh, having vision of heaven. I saw coming with clouds of heaven, one like the Son of Man. So he appears like Son of Man, like like a man, <laughs> but. When he reached at the ancient days, he was presented before him. Yeah. So there are two divine figures: the ancient one, yeah, the eternal one, and the Son of Man. Yeah. What is interesting? This Son of Man is coming with the clouds of heaven. And if you try to compare with other passage passages in the Old Testament, only one who is using clouds, yeah, who is riding the clouds, it's only God. So this son of man, yeah, appears like son of man, appears like a man, but it's not just a man. He's divine person. Why? Because he's riding the cloud. Okay. So Jesus was claiming himself as this son of man, yeah, the son of man, the one who is riding the cloud, a divine person. And of course, for the Jewish people, for the for the Sanhedrin who recognize this. Prophecy and this vision of Daniel, they recognize that Jesus was claiming himself as divine person. Now, if Jesus was lying, of course, Jesus was committing blasphemy, and blasphemy uh, deserved death. Yeah. However, if Jesus was telling the truth, then he is truly the Son of God. He is truly the divine person. Then, yeah. The Sanhedrin was passing judgment against God Himself. Yeah, it is the Sanhedrin who is doing the blasphemy. <laughs> yeah, uh, the blasphemy even killing the God or day side. Yeah, the technical terms. Okay, we continue. As I told you, it's going to be a bit long <laughs> because the story is very long. Then the whole assembly of them arose and brought him before Pilate. They brought charges against him, saying, "We found this man misleading our people. He opposes the payment of taxes to Caesar, and maintains that he is the Messiah, a king." Pilate asked him, "Are you the king of the Jews?" He said to him in reply, "You say so." Pilate then addressed the chief priests, the crowds, and I find this man not guilty. But they were adamant and said, he is inciting the people with his teaching throughout all Judea, from Galilee, where he began even there. On hearing this, Pilate asked if the man was a Galilean. And upon learning that he was under Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who was in Jerusalem at that time. So from the house of Caiaphas here, Jesus was being brought to the to the place of Pilate, the governor or the procurator. It is in here, uh, Antonia, yeah, Rotarium or Antonia, Fortress. Second trial, yeah. Pontius Pilate. P 
Pilate was the Roman governor or procurator of, in Judea during the time of Jesus. And Pilate's office was in Caesarea. Yes, I will show you later the, in the map. But he will go to Jerusalem during some big Jewish religious events. Yeah. According to Josephus, Pilate was known as the oppressive and even brutal leader. There are many stories about him who, who suppressed with, uh, with much violence uh, any rebellions, Jewish rebellions. However, he was lenient while dealing with Jesus. Why? <laughs> uh, yeah. But at the end, he agreed to the request of the, of the elders. Why he was uh, lenient? Because eventually, uh, Pilate was, of course, he was... He had been dealing. Yeah, he had been dealing a lot with the with the rebels, with criminals. Yeah, and he knew immediately that when he saw Jesus, this guy, this person is not. Yeah, is not. Is not guilty. Is not a rebel. Is not a criminal. Yeah, despite his uh, uh, admission that he is the Messiah, the King, but yeah. Immediately, Pilate, who has so many experience dealing with the rebellions, uh, rebellious people, he immediately recognized that this is innocent person. The charges changed from religious matter, blasphemy, to political issues, misleading the people, yeah. opposing payment of taxes to Caesar. If you still remember the story, when Jesus are asked whether it is lawful to pay Caesar, to, to pay yeah to pay tax to Caesar yeah and Jesus was the king of the Jews yeah however Pilate recognized that Jesus was not a rebel Pilate sent Jesus to Herod Antipas yeah this is not Herod the Great but Antipas who happened to be in Jerusalem yeah so we continue Herod was very glad to see Jesus he had been wanting to see him for a long time for he had heard about him and had been hoping to see him perform some sign. He questioned him at length, but he gave him no answer. The chief priests and scribes, meanwhile, stood accusing him harshly. He wrote his and his soldiers treated him contemptuously and mocked him. And after clothing him in the splendid garb, he sent him back to Pilate. Herod and Pilate became friends that very day, even though they had been enemies formerly. So Herod Antipas is one of the Herod the Great sons. Yeah. So when Herod the Great passed away in 4 AD, Antipas inherited Galilee and Antipas was the ruler when Jesus started his missions, yeah, his public ministry. Antipas was the most frequent dimension in the gospel and among, among the other sons of Herod the Great. Of course, the famous story is Antipas was also famous for beheading of John the Baptist, and he married Herodias, the wife of his brother Herod Philip. Yeah, you know the story. Yeah? The story of Jesus before Herod only appeared in the Gospel of Luke. Yeah, the story of Jesus before Herod, the yeah, trials of Jesus before Herod only appeared in the Gospel of Luke. So this is another unique materials in the Gospel of Luke. Um, previously, Herod had only heard of Jesus, whom he believed to be the recent John. Yeah, John who is resurrected. However, Herod did not get anything from Jesus. And after cursing Jesus, he sent Jesus back to Pilate. Yeah. Yeah, if you see the map, so this is a little map of Israel or Palestine during the time of Jesus. So Judea and Samaria is under the control of Pilate, the governor, and Galilee and Perea. So Galilee. And Perea is under uh, under Antipas. That's why Jesus was Jesus was coming from Nazareth, a Galilean. So he was subject to Herod Antipas. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Caesarea, Caesarea, yeah. Caesarea, Philly. Caesarea Maritima is here. You can see from the map somewhere here. So this is. Uh, used to be the office of Herod, uh, sorry, office of Pilate. But during the important event, yeah, uh, Herod will come and go to Jerusalem and monitor himself the, 
the different activities in Jerusalem. So Caesarea, Galilea, and Jerusalem. Pilate then summoned the chief priests, the rulers, and the people, and said to them, You brought this man to me and accused him of inciting the people to revolt. I have conducted my investigation in your presence and have not found this man guilty of charges you have brought against him. Nor did Herod, for he sent him back to us. So no capital crime has been committed by him. So here we say that we see that Pilate is conducting a fair, fairly fair trial. Yeah. Therefore I shall have him flogged, then release him. For of necessity he must release one unto them at the feast. But altogether they shouted, Away with this man, release Barabbas to us. Now Barabbas had been imprisoned for rebellion and that had taken place in the city and for the murder. Okay. So they are, Pilate again found Jesus not guilty, but to please the chief priests, the rulers, and the crowd, Pilate instructed Jesus to be flogged. Yeah. Now there was a custom to release a prisoner during the feast day because this is the, during the feast day of Passover one of the great celebration of uh, Jewish people. And Barabbas, a rebel and a murderer, being chosen. And what is interesting is the word Barabbas means the son of the father, Bar Abbas, yeah? Bar Abba, Bar son, Abba, father, yeah? son of the father. So it seems, it seems that the Jewish people, or at least the chief priests, are being presented, yeah? being the real son of God, is the real son of the father, Jesus, or the fake son of the father, Barabbas, yeah, the peaceful one or the violent one, yeah, the redeemer, the savior, or the murderer, yeah. So the choice was there, but unfortunately they uh, they chose the fake one, yeah. Again, Pilate addressed them, still wishing to release Jesus, but they continued their shouting, "Crucify him! Crucify him!" Pilate addressed them a third time, so even. Several times, yeah, third time. What evil has this man done? I found him guilty of no capital crime. Therefore, I shall have him flogged and then release him. With loud shouts, shouts, however, they persisted in calling for his crucifixion. Their voices prevailed. The verdict of Pilate was that their demand should be granted. So he released the man who had been in prison for rebellion and murder for whom they asked, and he handed Jesus over to them to deal with as they wishes, as they wish. Yeah, uh, this is the famous picture of Jesus, uh, of uh, Pilate washing his hands, but it's not appeared, yeah? It's not appeared in the Gospel of Luke. <laughs> so Pilate planned to release Jesus because he found Jesus not guilty. But because of the pressures, from the Sanhedrin and the other Jewish people, uh, basically a thread, yeah, a thread to report Pilate to Caesar. If you try to compare with John chapter 19, Pilate was being pressured uh, and he was being threatened if he refused to obey, uh, refused to to give in to the demands of the to the Sanhedrin or to the chief priest, to the high priest, they're going to report Pilate. <laughs> okay. Pilate handed Jesus over to those who wanted Jesus dead. There was no episode of Pilate washing his hands. Okay, so this is another unique thing about uh, Luke here. Yeah? As they led him away, they took hold of certain Simon, the Cyrenian, who was coming in from the country, and after laying the cross on him, they made him carry it behind Jesus. A large crowd of people followed Jesus, including many women who mourned and lamented him. Jesus turned to him and said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me. Weep instead for yourself and for your children. For indeed the days are coming when people will say, Blessed are the barren and wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. At the time, people will say to the mountains, fall upon us, and to the hills, cover us. For if these things are done, when the wood is green, what will happen when it is dry? 
Now to others, both criminals were led away with him to be executed. Okay, the start of the way of the cross. Uh, we have Simon of Siren. Yeah, Siren is uh, North Africa. Uh, I think it's in Algeria now. And who was probably a Jew living abroad or living in the diaspora was on pilgrimage in Jerusalem. Remember, this is the, the Jewish pilgrimage feast day, Passover. And this happened, Simon was there and he was forced to carry the cross. Jesus met women who wept for him, but he warned them that there will be a time when even greater tragedy will occur. Yeah, the destruction of Jerusalem at 70 AD. So Jesus was crucified, yeah, according to estimation, in April 433 AD. Yeah, and then another 40 years, it will be 70 AD when the Jerusalem will be surrounded besieged by the Roman Empire and being eventually being burned down. So, yeah, that's why Jesus said this, yeah, blessed are the barren and the wombs that are never born, yeah, because those mother who have children going to suffer a lot during this time of besiege, yeah, the time of uh, Jerusalem being besieged and being attacked by the Romans, yeah, because they're going to suffer the most, yeah, you say the mothers with children are the one who suffer most during the time of war, yeah. And they're going to say, mountain fall upon us. What does it mean? Yeah. One of the, well, one of the siege engine is what we call the catapult or the tribushi, uh, throwing earth, yeah, big stone to the city of Jerusalem. And it's better to be, to be, to be crushed by this boulder, yeah, immediately die rather than to inside the city they that they are going to experience uh so much hunger so much destruction and suffering yeah the wood is green living wood and the dried wood so the, this is the symbol of jerusalem uh the wood that is green symbolizes that The, the city of Jerusalem in, in its prime time, yeah? And it will come upon the time that it will come soon enough that these green leaves will be dried yeah? and things are getting worse. Yeah? Uh, they have rejected Jesus when Jerusalem is supposed to be accepted Jesus, when they're supposed to accept Jesus. And if they eventually rejected Jesus, things are getting worse. Yeah? From the green leaf, eventually going to dry and going to be burned. Yeah. Okay. So that's the meaning of the encounter with the women. Yeah. So there is no episode about the Veronica. You know, that's a, that's extra biblical event or narrative. Yeah. It's not in the Bible. Okay. The crucifixion. So we're almost there. Almost one hour also. When they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him and the criminals there, one on his right and the other on his left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. They divided this garment by casting lots. The people stood by and watched. The rulers when was near at him and said, he saved others, let him save himself if he is the chosen one, the Messiah of God. Even the soldiers jeered at him as they approached to offer him wine. They call out, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. Okay. So the crucifixion, yeah. The crucifixion is one of the most brutal forms of execution at ancient time. Yeah. Because the crucifixion intended to prolong the suffering of the victim. Uh, there are many methods of execution, yeah. throwing. Uh, Throwing by stone, yeah, throwing by stone, yeah. Uh, decapitating, yeah, beheading, hanging, yeah, and other things. But the worst kind is crucifixion, yeah, because you're going to be impaled uh, on the on the wood beam, yeah, the wooden beam. And usually it takes some time to die, yeah. It's going to take some, it's going to take even days, several days before you're going to die of as as 
uh, of losing breath and losing energy even by yeah and this is not only very painful but also very humiliating because you're going to be stripped of all your garments yeah yeah most of your garments and then yeah you're going to be left hanging there it's not only painful physically but also painful emotionally because you're going uh going to experience the most shameful thing in your life <laughs> Yeah, so that's what happened during the crucifixion. Uh, the crucifixion of Jesus, amid his suffering, Jesus prayed and forgave the people who crucified him. Yeah. Now, this is the first sentence or the first words, phrase at the cross. Uh, compared to the Mark and Matthew, Jesus only say one word yeah, in the Gospel of Matthew and Mark. But in the Gospel of Matthew, uh, sorry, the Gospel of Luke, Uh, Jesus mentioned uh, at least other three sentences, uh, three phrases. Yeah. So if you combine with the Gospel of John, you're going to have seven, yeah, seven words of Jesus. One coming from Mark and Matthew. Yeah. Three comings from the three comes from the three come from the Gospel of Luke, and the other three come from the Gospel of John. So all in all, we have seven words of Jesus. Yeah, in the cross. Uh, this is the this is the tradition of siete palabra, yeah, seven words of Jesus. What is interesting again? Uh, Jesus is very prayerful person. That's always uh, the fact that Jesus was always depicted by Luke as a prayerful person. Not only in the garden, but in fact in the cross, he was also praying to his father. And the praying of forgiveness. And Jesus was, um, Jesus was practicing what he said when he said that love your enemy, pray for them who persecute you. And Jesus was doing this. Yeah, he was preaching. He was doing what is what he preached, praying for the enemies, praying forgiveness, uh, loving the enemies, and praying for forgiveness. And prayer is become the life of Jesus. Yeah, prayer is. Uh, become the identity of Jesus, the most foremost character of Jesus, prayerful person. And in the moment of desperation, the moment of painful and shame, moment of pain and shame, Jesus continued to pray. Yeah, Jesus was mocked, the Savior, the Messiah, the King, yeah, who could not even save himself. Yeah, yeah. Despite of this humiliation, Jesus continued to pray. Above him, there was an inscription that read this is the king of the Jews now one of the criminals hanging there reviled Jesus saying you are not the Messiah save yourself and us the other however rebuking him said in reply have you no fear of God for you are subject to the same condemnation and in then and indeed we have been condemned justly for the sentence we receive correspond to our crimes. But this man has done nothing criminal. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He replied to him, Amen. I said to you today, you will be with me in paradise. The reason Jesus was crucified, this is the king of the Jews. Yeah? So it is uh, being posted at, uh, at the top of the cross. Yeah. However, uh, it's slightly different from the other gospel, and the more popular version is from the Gospel of John. Yeah, Jesus the Nazarene, Nazarian, Jesus the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. This is the most famous first, famous uh, version that being commonly used in our crucifix. Yeah, the conversion conversation. Yeah, conversation between Jesus and the criminal who repented. Uh, the two criminals, the two criminals, we don't have the names. <laughs> and according to the tradition, they are Dismas, yeah? Dismas and Jestas. The good one is Dismas. And Jesus said that today you will be with me in paradise. So the word paradise uh, in Greek is paradiso. And the word paradiso simply means garden. Yeah. So garden, the word garden. Again, the word garden appears, <laughs> uh, and this is the second words of Jesus, the second sentence, second phrase of Jesus. The first is, Father, forgive them, and second one is, 
today you will be with me in paradise. And it is interesting, yeah? Uh, the request of the the criminal or request was dismissed was to be allowed to enter his kingdom. But instead answering that you will be in my kingdom, Jesus said, you will be, be with me in paradise. Yeah, in Arden. So it, going back again to the, the Garden of Eden. Yeah, the Garden Eden. Jesus opened the gates of the garden that previously closed by Adam. In the cross, Jesus was undoing the sins and the curses of Adam. He is now opening the gate of the garden, which is closed, shut by the sin and curse of Adam. Okay, so this is interesting if you try to see the connection between the Adam and Jesus. Okay, it was now about noon, the darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon because an eclipse of the sun. Then the veil of the temple was torn down in the middle. Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands, I commend my spirit. And when he had said this, he breathed his last. The centurion who witnessed what had happened glorified God and said, this man was innocent beyond doubt. When all the people who had gathered for this spectacle saw what had happened, they returned home beating their breasts. But all his acquaintances stood at a distance, including the women who had followed him from Galilee and saw these events. Yeah, the death of Jesus. Jesus was crucified between 9 in the morning and 12 noon. Yeah, if you try to see the detail. Mark chapter 15, 25. So around that time, and about noon, the darkness came over the whole land until in the afternoon. When Jesus died, the veil of the temple was torn down and there, there was sun, sun's eclipse. So this is unique to the Gospel of Luke. Yeah? Jesus' last words, Father, into your hands I command my spirit, Numa. So this is coming from Psalm 31. Again, uh, Jesus at the last moment of his life on earth was saying his prayer. Yeah, He was reciting the Psalm 31. Testimony of the centurion. This man was innocent from beyond doubt. Uh, slightly different from the Mark's version because in Mark, the centurion would say that truly this is the Son of God. Yeah, But this time... Truly, this is innocent person. So the centurion, a gentile, was reaffirming uh, what Pilate, a Roman governor, saw in Jesus, innocent person. So this is a kind of irony that the Gentiles, the Roman, and the Roman, yeah, the Romans, recognize Jesus as someone innocent, but the Jewish leaders. Uh, Condemn Jesus. Yeah. Wanted Jesus to die. Okay. Uh, it is also indicated that the temple veil was torn apart. Yeah. Uh, if you're going to the temple of Jerusalem during the time of Jesus, uh, the temple was, uh, this is the inner, the inner sanctuary. And between the hell, the holy place to the inner sanctuary, holy of holiest, uh, it was divided by a curtain, a big curtain. And this curtain during the time, during when Jesus died, uh, being torn down, yeah, being torn apart. Uh, if you try to read the Matthew version, it is uh, it is indicated that uh, the torning is coming from above going down. So it's not done uh, by any human effort because if it is done so, it's supposed to be from down going up. Yeah, but according to information, according to information coming from Matthew, it is from up going up. Yeah, it's divine intervention. Now, there was virtuous, righteous man named Joseph who thought he was a member of the council. Had not consented to their plan of action, he came from Jewish town of Arimathea and was awaiting the kingdom of God. He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. After his head taken the body down, he wrapped it in a linen cloth 
and laid him a round cute tomb in which no one had yet been buried. It was the day of preparation and the Sabbath was about to begin. The woman who had come from Galilee with him followed him behind. And when they had seen the tomb, the way, the way in which his body was laid in, they returned and prepared spices and perfume oils, and they rested on the Sabbath according. They rested on the Sabbath according to the commandment. Yeah. Uh, so this is a little uh, illustration about the city of Jerusalem. So this is uh, Jerusalem facing. Uh, West, yeah, west side. This is the temple of Jerusalem, yeah, and outside of the temp, outside of the wall of Jerusalem, there, there is a small hill. This is Golgotha, yeah, Golgotha. The word Calvary is uh, Latin, yeah, Latin. From Golgotha is Hebrew, yeah. So if you try to zoom in, so yeah, so this is the temple, and this is the wall, the west wall of Jerusalem. And this is the Golgotha, yeah. And not far from Golgotha, not far from the Calvary, there is a new tomb belongs to Joseph of Arimathea. Yeah. Uh, it is important that Jesus' body was removed immediately, yeah, because according to Deuteronomy 21, his corpse shall not remain on the tree overnight. Yeah, it is imperative that bodies uh, shall be removed immediately. Joseph of Arimathea, a member of Sanhedrin, who also Jesus' disciple, who was responsible for the burial. Yeah, he he went to Pilate and then negotiated uh, for the body of Jesus, and then he even donated his new tomb. Yeah, his new tomb. The new tomb for Jesus located not far from the skull, Golgotha. So the new tomb was not far from the city of Jerusalem. And the closest to the city of Jerusalem, meaning it's going to be more expensive. <laughs> so you, we know that Joseph Arimate is a very important person also. The funeral was also fast and hasty because of the Sabbath was about to start. Remember, Jesus was, uh, Jesus was crucified on Friday and he died. Friday afternoon, uh, 3 p.m. And yeah, uh, Friday sunset, it's a new day, the beginning of Sabbath day. So before Sabbath, Jesus has need to be buried here. Yeah? And Jesus was rested. In a sense, Jesus was also rested during the Sabbath. Yeah? The rest day, Jesus was resting inside the tomb. <laughs> Okay, so the tomb was not, uh, it's, a, it's a bit different. Uh, usually when we speak about the tomb or the cemetery, you're going to dig a hole going down and then put the body inside of the hole and then cover the hole with the earth, yeah? But during the time of Jesus, it's a bit different, yeah? You're going to use the, the caves, yeah? The caves are, are you going to carve out uh, a portion of the hills, yeah, a stone hill to make a kind of uh, man-made cave, and they're going to put inside the bodies, yeah, the bodies inside the cave, and then they're going to close the cave with a big stone, yeah, with a big stone. And usually after one year, the family will go back and will get the the bones of the the deceased relative, and then they're going to put it in the box. They call it as the, yeah, going to put it in the box, yeah. Okay, uh, that's what happened to Jesus, yeah. Jesus was being, uh, being clothed with linen, the body, and the body was put inside the tomb, the new tomb, yeah, the new tomb. And this tomb eventually become, will, will be covered, will become the Holy Sepulchre, yeah, the, the church, the Basilica of the Holy Sepulchre. And if you're going inside this church, you're going to see this kind of structure and this structure uh, house, yeah, or cover the tomb of Jesus. If you go inside, you're going to see the, the kind of stone, yeah, a stone, small, yeah, 
a kind of stone uh, which is believed to uh, we believe to be the to be the place where the body of Jesus was yeah rested and this is the place also where Jesus resurrected yeah resurrected so this is very important place because this is the silent witness of Jesus death and resurrection Jesus was rested on the seventh day yeah Jesus rested during the sabbath day and on the eighth day or in the first day of the week Jesus resurrected yeah the new creation the new creation yeah that's all for tonight <laughs> I know it's a long discussion because as I said a while ago, it's a long gospel, a long reading, but hopefully you were able to see uh, a little bit about the dynamic of the passion narrative according to St. Luke, yeah, where Jesus was presented mainly as the new Adam who 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 undone, yeah, who undone, who undid rather the curses of the first Adam. Okay, we try to see if we have uh, questions. Uh, from Natalie Utami, pray intention, may we able to celebrate Easter this year with full of joy and happiness. Okay, amen. From Anna Elisa Opi, Father, can you perhaps a larger picture of the situation around our Lord's trial? What is what? But is it a high-profile case? There was a crowd of people. How did they know about this trial? Had elders provoked them? Yeah. Um, during those times, there are a lot of people. Yeah, yeah. Because this is the high time. This is the Jewish Passover, and thousands and thousands of people are at the city of Jerusalem. At the city of Jerusalem, some people are supportive of Jesus. Uh, they are sympathetic to Jesus. They are believe in Jesus. Yeah. Uh, and these are the one who welcome Jesus. Yeah, these are the well. They are the one who welcome Jesus. However, there are a portion of people who also hated Jesus. Yeah, hated Jesus. And these people easily being manipulated by the high priest to support that their cause. Yeah, because uh, for the, of course, uh, they hated. Jesus because first because Jesus was for them is blasphemous yeah uh, blasphemer and of course as I said a while ago someone who blasphemed the Lord should die and of course they they don't like any people like Jesus who will bring another violent rebellion because remember Jesus was uh, was claiming to be the king yeah to be the Messiah. And of course, the high priest does not like not like their their status quo being uh, disturbed, yeah, their position being disturbed. So they need to need to dispose Jesus as soon as possible. As I said a while ago, they are they are not working alone, yeah, because there are other Jewish people who hated Jesus also, and they can be easily manipulated by the elders, by the high priest to support their cause, yeah. So yeah, uh, I often heard that the people who welcome Jesus is the same people who uh, who shouted "Crucify Jesus!" Yeah, but I don't think they are the same people. Why? As I said a while ago, there are a lot of people in Jerusalem during those times, and it is very very possible that some faction, some people, some group are very supportive of Jesus, but there are some people also who are uh, in opposition of Jesus. During the trial, it is these people who are hated Jesus, who are conspired together, who are being manipulated, and they are the one who push for the death of Jesus. Okay. Yeah. From Raphael Sien, is it true from the criminal beside Jesus? We can learn that it's never too late to repent. Yes, it's true that uh, we... As long as we are truly sorry for what we have done, even at the last moment of our life, yeah, the forgiveness is always possible. Yeah, the forgiveness is always possible. And I said, and even the criminal himself said that we they have been justly, yeah, they have been they receive, they have justly condemned. Yeah, they have received punishment according to their sin. In a sense, they have also uh, received justice. Yeah, they have. Uh, they have been punished justly because of their action. 
and because of that uh and because of that uh yeah <laughs> uh And of course, they they are saying so. Uh, this mass was repenting, yeah. And then, yeah, because truly sorry, the gates of heaven is open. A paradise is open. Uh, now we are not sure whether this mass were ex- or this mass or or this good thief experiencing uh, purgatory or not, yeah. Uh, or he has special. Uh, special kind of grace coming from the Lord. Yeah, we are not sure, but Jesus has promised that He is, He will be in paradise. Yeah, because He is repenting, and He is hoping for the salvation of the Lord during even last hours. Yeah, of course we are not, we are not called to be like that. <laughs> yeah, we are called to repent now. Yeah, don't delay our repentance because. Uh, we are not lucky enough. Yeah, we might not that lucky enough <laughs> that we might die immediately, even without the opportunity of repenting. So we start our repentance now, while we are still very much alive. Yeah, do not delay. Yeah, do not delay. Yeah. Okay. I hope that's. Uh, I hope that will answer your questions. Okay, that's all. So yeah, thank you everyone. Thank you so much. And I would like to apologize to my friends, those who are joining through Zoom because there are some technical problems. Uh, uh, the setting, the the layout setting was not. We have we have having we have we are having problem with the setting of the screen adjustment. So please. Oh, it's been fixed. Okay, praise the Lord. <laughs> okay, uh, I would like to thank my friend, uh, my friend Sylvie, who serve as our moderator and also technician and also for Maria for the layout this year. So hopefully you will be able to have a good and fruitful and blessed Holy Week. And yeah, for next week, we don't have Bible study because it's Holy Week. So you may focus on your... Holy Week celebration in your parish and your churches and continue to pray for one another and hope to see you soon next time. God bless you all. We close with a prayer. Okay, where is the prayer? Okay. In the name of the Father, the Son, of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Oh, sorry. This is in Bahasa. Okay, we pray. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now in the hour of our death. Amen. The Lord be with you. May the Almighty God bless you all. Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless everyone and see you around. God bless.